So this is the second kind of Diophantine equation, sort of. It's the next one. And these are very popular. These are called Pythagorean triplets. You may have even heard of them. Pythagorean. I think this is a good topic to very useful topic also. So basically, uh, you know that you have if this length is A, this length is B, this is C, you know that A square plus B square. Right, this is correct. Now, basically, we are interested in those right angle triangles in which all the three sides are integers. So, when are uh, A, B, and C integers? This is the fundamental question that we will try to answer. In the course of this class. So, are there any uh, examples that you know to begin with the basic things, the examples, if there is any which you know? Right. Sir, three, four, and five. Yeah, right. So, that's the, that's the first example three, four, and five. Let's see. So this is one example. So basically, this turns into this number theory question. I mean, just stated like this, uh, stated in the form of equation. So this is one triangle. So this is one combination, you know, two squares with sum is again a square. That's a very important thing. So any other examples? Sir, if you multiply any number, positive number to these three, then you will get one. Um, any positive number, is that right? Any positive number, for example? So two. Huh? You multiply two, then, so then how do you, if I multiply by two, I get this. Is this what we want, or do you modify something in that and say? So this is not a solution so far. Written like this, it does not a solution, right? Because uh, two times three square is not a square. Sir, sir, only to three, four, and five, not no. three square. Ah, square. sorry. Yeah. So that's what uh, you meant, right? Got it. Okay. Exactly. So you are saying that. If A, B, and C uh, is a pipe, let's just let me say like this. So you know, in in P, so this is the saying that it is a Pythagorean triplet. In P belongs to P. P is like this huge family of uh, triples which work, right? Whose sum of squares of the first two is equal to a square. Okay, and this just means that A comma B comma C works. I'm just writing it in that language. Uh, someone uh, join, wants to join. Yes, yes, okay. So we just started. Uh, we just started with uh, this. So if you, so basically, we are interested in when is sum of, sum of square of two numbers, uh, sum of squares of two numbers is also a perfect square. Uh, this is the same question as you know, uh, what are those? Right angle triangles in which the three, all three sides are all three sides. Okay. So uh, we have a kind of a beginning example, okay. and then uh, there's a question I ask: How do you? What are more examples? And so uh, Aparna has given a simple way to generate right, to generate more examples, and uh, that is uh, being said as if ABC is a, is an example is in P then you can multiply with any number A and it works.
okay so uh, for example you get uh, two times three you get two times three square plus two times four square equals two times five square. Right, and for any n you can do. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> is the reverse also true? So, so will it be that if you have a, a triplet, then if you divide it by any positive number, you will done? Yes. If you yeah. So, is that always possible? So, I mean, whenever it's possible, it's possible in the sense that uh, whenever they have a GCD, right? Whenever GCD of A, B, and C is uh, not one, then you can divide by the GCD or, you know, any common divisor, right? Yeah. Uh, as long as, like, obviously, as long as we divide by common divisors. If you don't divide by a common divisor, then you will get some fraction. So, there's, then that those are you're not interested in, right? So, uh, yes, yeah, as long as uh, as long as uh, we divide by uh, common devices by some common device. So these are some easy things. What I'm trying to, you know, uh, say here is, this is this is the just a habit that we that one must cultivate in the sense, like you have this uh, equation and to which you want to find out, let's say, understand the set of solutions, what triples work, what whatever works, right? So far, we are not really just directly going to find the solutions. Right? We are just we are also exploring the nature of that collection. Like you have absolute solution, you can jump to another solution by multiplying by a constant, come back. This structure in the set can also be very, very useful. So, yeah. But fine, so far it is good. Are there any other truly different solutions? Any other uh, truly different solution which doesn't come from three four five by this simple rule so i think this one with sorry um, one second, so that's yeah. So, is there any other? Sir, five, twelve, thirteen. Five, twelve, thirteen. Right. That's another very nice solution. So, these are the. This is the other solution. So we have this one solution, we have another, we have this one solution, we have this other solution, three, four, five. Now tell me, I mean, what do you guys think? I mean, what should be the plan to find out all solutions? How to find, how should we go about finding all solutions. That's one question. Maybe how to 
um, how to get more original solutions how to get more maybe i'll replace the word original by primitive so can anyone of you infer what primitive means here how to get more primitive solution do you understand what solution means right solution just means i'm asking for three numbers we solve the problem we solve this problem Three, four, five is one original example. Five, twelve, thirteen is one original example. So these I'm calling primitive, right? That's just the word which we use in math, right? Primitive. So definition should be that they don't have a common GCD. Is it clear, right? They want those solutions which don't have a common GCD because these are the truly atomic solutions using which you can generate uh, other, you know, easy solution, easily generate other solutions. So how do we find more primitive solution? That is the question. Like these two, uh, so maybe if you know from before or you kind of just work out, how do you go about finding more? So now from now on, let's not focus on, we'll stop focusing on those solutions which kind of have, which are like this, right? Which have a common uh, divisor, these, they, they are not interesting. We are interested in those yeah, which don't have. So we are interested in these primitive Pythagorean triplets yeah, because they, they are the ones which are not understood, right? Because once pretty primitive ones are understood, then other ones are just multiples. Yeah. That, that thing is out of the way. How do we find them? Sir, so can we say that all primitive solutions have at least one prime number? Hmm. Is that true? That's a good question. That seems to be... Let's see. Do all primitive have at least one side prime? This is a good question. Let's think about this. So, so what do you guys think? Nagesh, what do you think? Do you think that any solution uh, which is primitive will have at least one component prime? Does that seem to be? Let's see. Let's see. So one way is to try to find more. That will tell you. Unless we know more solutions, it's difficult to say if this pattern, so far it is holding. Try to get more solutions. That's one way.
what about any idea yeah so maybe maybe so far it's in typical i mean there are many questions which we would like to answer right how to get how to find all primitive solutions is certainly all meaning all primitive as i've said is the if you can do that then everything almost is solved and how to get more primitive solutions so we are not able to get more than two so far this is another third question fourth question is like I mean, are there infinitely many primitive solutions or finitely many primitive solutions? Not writing that, but you see, these are so many questions that could be answered without really answering that finding all. It's not really needed to find all. Most often, it's not possible. In this case, can be. we will do. Let's now. Uh, um, Sir, I get seven twenty-four and twenty. Ah, seven. 24. 24 and 25. 25, good. This also has a prime. So, so far it seems that the pattern is correct. But uh, let's see. Yeah. This is, uh, as I hope, that it is correct. I'm not. Yeah. But, that's it. but how did you get it? Is it just through random checking one by one, like increasing the and so on? Or... Sir, I took the next prime number, added. Uh, the next squares to forty nine hundred. Oh. So then you should ask if for is for is every prime a part of a Pythagorean triplet? Right. Yes, that is what you have tried to do, and you have succeeded in that also. In that, okay. so that might be a simpler thing to prove, even than this, right? Is every prime part of a Pythagorean triple? And then one can ask many questions on this line. So we'll not ask any more questions, we'll try to answer some questions. But this is good, right? Let me come to this uh, theme, come back to this theme of parametrization. The way I see it, that common theme of parametrization, which we had seen earlier, also helps us. Okay. I just write parametrization here. But the question I will ask is not like this in the technical way, but the question is. Can you think of an algebraic identity that you have done in this school or something which resembles this? Can you think of an algebraic identity which resembles this? Yeah, so identities, you know, right? Like, uh, so one identity, for example, is I mean, something which is true for all that. So can you think of an algebraic identity like this identity? But this is not like that so far. So can you think of an algebraic identity where you have sum of squares and it again leads to a square or something like that? Or at least an identity in which you have sum of squares. So your voice is breaking a little bit. Yes. Uh, so do you think it's because of the internet or is it because of this microphone? Is it clear now? Or is it hello? Hello? Sir, I think it was just the internet. It is the internet, right? Yeah, so I'll change the connection. I don't know. Today it was raining a lot. Yeah, I'll use this. Yeah, so even I had an interview today, uh, and uh, in between there was a little bit problem. Change it. Uh, it's a long day. I just change the connection. Mm. Yeah, but this is Zoom, and the Zoom will get closed. So let me know. Is it clear now? I will not change. Is it? Uh, the voice is it breaking or is it clear? Hello? Yes, sir, I can hear you. 
is, is the is the voice going clearly or is it breaking uh, 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 hello yeah yeah it sounds clear it is clear uh okay okay yeah so so then uh, can you think of an algebraic identity which resembles this should be able to so what is the identity you have seen where you have some of squares so you would notice that there would be this identity uh x square or rather x plus y whole square x minus y whole square and uh, so what's the identity this is equal to what oh, wait no so this is not uh, so that actually comes to difference of squares sorry uh, yeah uh, never mind so we'll see this i this is uh, everybody agrees this is the uh, yeah, so my question was not so good. So straightforward. Is this okay? Yeah, Aparna, are you there? Uh, yes. Uh, what happened? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So then uh, please tell me then, is this identity okay? This is just a simple identity, right? All of us know this, right? So from here, I mean, how do you choose X and Y so that you get this sort of thing? So I'll just write it like this. Uh, yeah. How do you choose the X and the Y? So that you get a sum of squares. What should you choose the X and the Y as? So the questions are there with us, so not a problem. Maybe I'll start writing on the board someday. Right. It will be let me we'll try once and see what how it is. Means we can close in it up and I'll write on the board. That might be slightly more different. Let's see. Yeah, so now you have to really choose the x and the y so that this I mean how do you have to choose? You have to choose the x and the y so that this one becomes a square. Right? How do you make it a square? How do you make the four x y? What do you choose x and y to be? And you're free to choose it to be anything, right? You just just start getting solutions. Then for any x and y that sir, you sir x minus y sir right? x minus y can be negative as well. That's not a that's not a problem. I mean, it's a square in the end, right? In okay, so simply put, we can just assume that x is bigger than y, and do this, right? But even if it is less, it doesn't matter. You're squaring, right? But now we have to choose x and y to be of a special kind, right? So that this 4xy becomes a square. So what's the easiest way to do that? Just choose x to be a perfect square. All right, <laughs> some m square. And just choose y to be some n square. I mean, if you want to get this, that's what you should do. If you want to get something like this, that's what you should do. You see, this is how algebraic identities can give you loads of solutions, right? can give you a family of solutions. So you get, uh, so I should start writing. And now this becomes this so what have we done so what what does this imply
Mm -hmm. You see, so we have shown that for any M and N, yes, for any M and N, we have found a solution like this. What is the solution? So this becomes your A, right? I mean, A and B. This is your B, and this is your C. Isn't this wonderful, right? This algebraic identity gives you a way to find infinitely many solutions. <clears throat> so just make sure you have understood this. Aparna, do you have do you understand this? How this will start give you solutions yes. for yeah for any M and N. And you see, this technique yes. is a subtle technique. It's, I mean, it's a different technique from maybe what you know so far. Right? Guessing the an identity that looks like this. And then building upon it. There's a whole technique of this, is a chapter on this parametrization, is a whole chapter. But for now, maybe it's a little uh, immature to try to do that all at once. So slowly, slowly, we are doing. Earlier, also, we sort of used an algebraic trick of cancellation, right? To get from one solution to other solutions, right? It's x naught plus t times something. Just that adjustment, that algebraic adjustment allowed us to find infinitely many. And then later, we proved they are all, all solutions. Here it's a the lines this way, right? You guess the identity, and from there you build. Yeah. So you choose in a special form, and then you. So now, I mean, the first question should be: I mean, can you fit the solutions uh, that we have so far into this? Can we do that? Can we fit the three, four, five into this? So can you find the M and N so that you get three, four, five? Sir, M can be uh, root 3? No, 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 you should take integers. No, no, because M and N have to be integers, right, for this to work. Otherwise, this 2 M and N, right, it will not be an integer. Yeah, may not be an integer. It can be, but may not be. One and two. Uh, one and two? Yes, that's the simplest thing, right? So just take, uh, so I'll just take 2 and 1. We'll just go keep it. Same thing. Uh, you just take this, then you can just check, right? You get four minus one, three, and here you get four, and here you can check, you get five. So that solution which we found, it comes under this. Solution we found comes under this, right? So that's a good thing, yeah? So this gives uh, three, four, five. Okay. Can we find the that one also under this? So you just choose some M and N. Sir, I three. Yes, two and three. Then, um, yeah, yeah, right. Same things. I think. So this also comes under this class, and uh, let's write it. Uh, three and two, or uh, two and three. So that doesn't matter. You can scrap the n and n. And similarly, you can check that that also will come under this. So, so what does this make us think? What does this make us conjecture? What should be our conjecture? Well, one thing that we have already shown. Just from this very, like, no number theory so far, right? Like, no divisibility, no arguments, nothing so far. Just this algebraic identity and not a very, not a very strange identity, quite well known. Yeah. Just from there, we are able to get number one, infinitely many solutions. Right? If you keep changing the M and N, you get infinitely many solutions. My first question is, do we get infinitely many from here? So we'll now focus on this for one time and we'll ask this. From here, do we get infinitely many 
primitive solutions. That's what I mean when I say solutions, but still, uh, do we have uh, infinitely many primitives? And you know what primitive solutions mean? You should not, the only is that the ABC should not have any common divisor. Certainly, we have infinitely many choices of MNN, right? You can keep choosing MNN to be anything. You can choose MNN to be anything, and you'll get solutions. But when do you get primitive solutions? Meaning that no, no uh, common factor. So another thing I see that M is always one greater than M. Um, yes, but that will not always hold. So, so, so basically from here, you try to see M is always one greater than M. No, M is always one greater than M. M. No, I mean, why? You can choose M to be, as I'm saying, right? You can choose M and N to be anything, right? For all M and N, right? You can choose the M and N to be anything. So, for example, just choose two and four, so two, okay, two and five. Right? So, you choose M to be five, and you choose N to be two. That's up to you. And you do this and you see that solution is even primitive. See, you, you get uh, 25 minus 4, that is 21. 5 to the 10, 10 to the 20. Okay, this is, um, <clears throat> this is no, but this is okay. This is A, A this is a, A and B. Okay. And the next is this 27, right? Why? This is a primitive solution, All right? So the point is that this is a this is the thing is that you can choose any any MNN, right? And you get solutions. Yeah. Is this solution primitive? Wait. Yeah. Then GCD is of 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 MNN is one. Then is that when we get primitive? Ah, so that's. Uh, uh, so that's the question. Let's see. You know, yeah, that is. If the city of M and N is one, does that imply primitive? So we'll put a question mark. Okay, we'll do that. But so, and up now, do you see that is this solution primitive? That's my question. So won't it be 29, 20 and uh... oh yeah 29 okay right mm -hmm. but is the solution primitive yeah because there is no common factor yes yes yeah so Abhinav do you see this I want you to see this right? yes sir yeah right? good so this is a primitive solution We'll come back to that. We'll come to that. Uh, yeah. uh, this is basically can give us a way to generate primitives. But let us uh, try other values of MNN. 
and just just get more feel for it. Okay, so uh, maybe we can take. Um, so what can we take? Uh, seven and two. I mean, these are just the natural things to try, right? Then what is it that we get? 40, 49 minus 4, 45. Yeah. And we have 28. And uh, then we have 49 plus 4. Okay. Uh, so this is, uh, is it primitive? Yes, because there's no common. But again, this 50 is a prime. 29 is also a prime. So we are getting at least one prime so far. Do you think we will always get prime, at least one prime? Sir, I think we'll always get a prime if it's a primitive solution. No, I mean, yeah, it has to be primitive, otherwise there's no chance. It has to be primitive. But in primitive, they're saying you will always get. But just take a few more examples quickly and see. Like you can take like three and maybe three and five, you see what you get. Three and three and uh, four, maybe just check to always get at least one prime. See, three and eight, you can try three and seven and see if you get primitive. Try just just two minutes if you guys try some values, you will get answer to most of this. All these two, three questions we have. If we choose three and five, we are not getting two terms. Yeah. Uh, so that's so that answers your question that this does not imply that uh, just if you choose that uh, one, this does not imply that. So what do we get for three and five? Something non-primitive. So, so three and five is not a primitive one and a nine. Yeah, right. So you see, so to get primitive solution, just taking O prime is not enough. What is it that we get? Um, five and three, I need this. 34, 30, 34, 30, and 16. Right. It's not true. So now we should think what more condition should we add? It's certainly M and N have to be co prime. If you have any hope of getting primitive, that should be co prime. If they are not co prime, then we have a GCD. Then, so certainly there will be a GC between these two things because M and N have a GC. But we need some more condition, right?
and do you always get at least one prime that one refuted or that one still holds That's we still get one. one. Okay, three and eight uh, is it right? M equal to three, N equal to eight. Yeah, we get. Um, Sorry. No, no. Three, three and eight. So it can, has a prime. It has a prime. If it is three and eight, you get a prime. Um, I don't know. Three and ten is it still? Is it a prime? Yeah, 109 is a prime. I mean, uh, okay, so let's keep trying. Four and seven, we have not tried. Not a prime. Yeah, this is not a prime. Four and seven, I think, doesn't give a prime, right? What do we get when we take four and seven? Seven and n equal to four. Not a prime means there are no primes. Okay, so it's primitive, but there are no primes. Yeah. So it is not true that we should have at least one prime. Yeah. Now that's not something to be surprised or sad about or surprised about in the sense that you we cannot expect such a thing. Right? I mean, it's very. Uh, it's I've never seen a statement like that. There, uh, you always get at least one prime. I mean, okay. Yeah, when you have so, when you have so many possibilities, right? It is hard to get that you will always get a prime. Otherwise, it sort of gives some some kind of a pattern to the prime. Right? Okay. Not really because we don't. We are not saying you get all primes. Yeah. But you get some kind of a pattern, maybe. So that is out of the way. Now the question is, how do we get primitive solutions? Then we can answer if we get all, if we get infinitely many primitive solutions. So how do you ensure that this is primitive? How do we ensure that A and B are co-prime. See, notice that you only need to ensure that A and B don't have a common factor, right? Because if A and B have a common factor, then you will it will, they will also have a common factor with C because of the equation, right? So you just need to ensure that A and B are co-prime. How do you ensure, I mean, so how do you ensure that this, and this is the is one. Certainly, M and N should have the one, but we need more conditions. What is that condition? So, what you think about? It's the opposite parity. Opposite parity. That certainly is needed, right? So, Aparna, do you see? If M and N have the same parity, like if M and N are both odd, if M and N, if M and N are both odd, then what happens? This becomes even, and then there's a GCD. Right? So certainly yes. we need opposite parity. Is it also enough to have opposite parity? Plus, so we need this is the added, this is the added condition, okay? Opposite parity. Is it enough if we have these two things? So four and seven is odd and even. Uh, sorry, four and seven? 
Sir, in the four and seven example, we got a primitive one, but they are odd. In... Yeah, so they are opposite parity, right? Yeah. You see, whenever we got primitive, they are all opposite parity. And when we did not take opposite parity, we did not take it. So opposite parity is necessary. That is, but is it also sufficient? That is the question. If you take M and N opposite parity, does it imply that, does it imply this? Does it imply that the G3 is one? Then that just means it's primitive. Yes, right. That should yeah. be enough. How? Yeah. So why is that enough? Since uh, since A and B will be uh, odd and even, there will be no common factor at all. No, just odd and even doesn't mean that there is no common factor. Right. That is not true. Okay, okay. Yeah. So this is the this is the number theory question. If there are two numbers, so we can forget all the things above and just focus on this one. If you have two numbers M and N, which are co prime. And they have opposite parity. So one of them is odd. So you can assume that right and right, M is odd and N is even. M odd and N even. Let me just ask this show. Notice that M and N are co-prime. This is the question that just focus on this part now. And then this M square minus N square and two M N, they don't have a common factor. Yes, and the way I wanted to say in the beginning how we get the identity is this is something that we always do. I remember in algebra, right? You take a difference of squares and you square them and then you 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 have this and you... Right? This is the way we always we used to do, right? This identity is very common. And basically, I came to that in a bad way, I think, in the beginning. But anyway, now we know it. Eh? The difference of squares should not divide M N, right? No, it will not. It will certainly not divide, but there is no common factor, right? There is no common factor between M square and M square minus N square with M, right? So, can you show that this is one? Next question. 
Let me ask a simpler question. This will be homework. GCD of M and N is one. So now focus on this simpler question. Prove that this implies that GCD of M minus N and N is one. So show this. This is a fundamental property of GCD that really allows us to. Can you show the GCD of M and N? If that is one, then M minus N and N also GCD is one. This we must do. Then we can do. So let me take the example of seventeen and twenty. Mm -hmm. Right, so then it works. Or so this question only I'm focusing on. But then how do we prove that it is all? So now see, now it's not about parity and so on. Obviously, GCP is one means opposite parity already. I mean, uh, no, I mean, no, 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 sorry. I mean, I'm just saying GCD is one. I'm not saying opposite parity on just that last blue black black question from that. So we just want to prove it. So we see the basic way to prove this thing is I mean just uh, and how do you know that the GCD is one? Right? We just want to show that there is no common factor. So if D D divides M minus N, if there is common factor, then D divides M minus N and D divides N. Well, that implies the D divides M. Just add them, right? D divides M. And that means D divides M and D divides N. But there is no such D. Right? D is 1 in that case. And so 1. So then it implies that D is 1. That's just the thing about divisibility, right? If D divides something, D divides D divides B, D divides the sum, D divides the difference. Just take that and work it out yourself. So let me know if that is fine. Then I will try to think. Uh, is it okay? Yeah. yeah. That is fine, right? It's just small exercise. I just want it to be just so that you can maybe write it once on your own and check. It's a simple reasoning. And the same kind of reasoning you have to apply here and show that, you know, this m square minus n square can have nothing in common with m one step you work out. m square minus n square can have nothing in common with n. Same thing, but, you know, let's work it out one. So in general, MN is not something that you have to worry about. The two is something that we might have to worry about. For that, we put the condition that is. And so there is. But write this out. If you don't write it, then you don't know it. Then it's not counted as an You have to write it. If you write it, then you would know. If you, if you get stuck, then you would know. So, but this is the. Okay. So we have infinitely many primitive solutions because obviously we can have infinitely many. Right now, so basically, to get primitive solutions, all we need to do is to choose M and N which are co-prime and opposite. Pair. Choose M and N which are co-prime and have opposite. Pair. That's all.
and you can obviously do it. Right? Choose M and N, the four prime, and have opposite pairs. That's all. That's all you need. And in this way, you get infinitely many solutions. That's Now, this was one question that was asked in the beginning of the class, somewhere in the, towards the beginning. Um, does every prime occur in some time? Not yet answered. So, so far, what do you guys think? Do you think uh, this is good? This can be done? No, we saw 33, No, no, this is, a, this is a different question. So obviously, in every solution, we don't get prime. It's not true that any primitive solution will have a prime. But this was the other more delicate, more easier question, sort of, right? In the sense that more easily satisfiable, hopefully, is given any prime, Will it occur in some primitive solution? Not saying that every primitive solution will have a prime. Start with the prime P. Is there a primitive solution in which P occurs? This is not the same question. Yes, upon like there may be some yes. primitive solution where none none of the element, none of the sides are a prime. That's fine. We don't are interested in that. Among those for which, among those which have primes, do we get all primes somehow? Or asked in this way, it is given any P, can you make a right angle triangle with that P as a side? That is a different question. That is the question. So let's just think, I mean, can you make P the hypotenuse? Is it always possible that you can make P the hypotenuse? From here, what can we say? Well, from here we can we can we can say no. Because I mean it is not true because if this has to be the hypotenuse, then this has to be P. From the solutions that we know so far, from the solutions that we know so far, uh, this is not true. You cannot write any prime as a sum of Can you give an example of a prime which cannot be written as a sum of two squares? So seven No, I just want one prime. No, no, just one prime which cannot be written as a sum of two squares. Seven, right? Seven is a prime, right? Seven cannot be written. Yeah, as so that's seven. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. So the maybe the that's right, because it's a, it has to be, I mean, this is this cannot be three modulo four. We have seen all this. But also you can score. So from what we know, you cannot have P on the hypotenuse, right? That's clear. But can you write any prime P as a difference of two squares? Can you write any prime P as a difference? Okay, let's forget about two, apart from two. Two you cannot write in this way, right? Because two is not, this is going to be odd. So given any prime P, can you tell me some M and N so that it's prime P? P is what is given to you. Can you find some M and N so that you get this? Then P will become one of the sides. So you have to find the M and N, right? Find this. Mm -hmm. M minus one. 
M minus N should always be one, right? Yes, right. So M minus because one of the factors have to be one, right? Because the prime cannot be factorized. So we will need M minus N to be one, and uh, then obviously M plus N to be one. But this you can always solve, right? You can always solve this. You get so four and ah uh, sorry. So four and four. Four and two. Four and three, three. Four and three. Yeah, four and three. No, four and three. You get seven. That's good. But for any prime, can you do it? And the answer is yes. Right? You can just like yeah. So basically, this is again this basic, right? You have the factorization, and then you m m minus n has to be one. But see, the question is for any prime, can you find an answer? For seven, it's fine. We have already found for some solution. I think like that. I mean, whatever. Yeah, that's fine. So we want to know if for any prime you can do, it. and the answer is yes. Just take something. Like this. this is what we get from the solution. And these are some small, small number theory, small number theoretic observations that we are using. Just that you know, if p is factored like this, then one of them has to be one, the other has to obviously then be p, and then you have this, and you solve this, you find. That's it. So any prime answer is yes. So not every primitive solution has primes. We answer that, but a little bit is I mean, a weaker version of that question is true. So this up under this was your question, right? A sort of what you were using to generate the next solution, right? And it indeed turns out that for any prime you can do. Okay, it's not this. Okay. So this is the thing. Now you can ask your own questions and try to. So what are the key, key next questions? Well, the main next question is: Are these solutions odd? That's it. I mean, that's that's the if you can answer that, then that's a very good thing. Are these solutions odd? Okay. That's one question. Next question is: I mean, which primes can occur as the hypotenuse? Okay, we have so seen that any prime can occur as a side. But if you are interested in hypotenuse, if you are interested in something which is a prime, can you build a right angle triangle? Always. I mean, in that sense, the hypotenuse is fixed and is a prime. Which primes occur as hypotenuse? You will try to answer. This will answer this question. Okay, this is a good question to think about, right? And then we can. There is a very interesting way to connect this. I think. Uh, Trying, I was just trying to work that out. I have not worked. I am not able to work it out completely now, but I will able to next class. I'll work it out in the class. Please. Um, that so, is, can you repeat first question? First, uh, the, yeah, the first the first question is basically that uh, see we have found infinitely many solutions in this way, right? This m square plus n square. Uh, I should say this m m square minus n square. 2mn and m square plus n square, right? In this way, we have found infinitely many solutions, and that has answered so many questions, right? Good. So that's a good thing. But what is the question that we should be asking now? What question did we set out to? Well, are these all solutions? Is this will give you infinitely many solutions? But is any solution possible to be written like this? That is the question, right? I mean, if I give you any a, b, and c, is it possible to write it in this way? Is it possible to find the m and n so that you can write a as m square minus n square, b as two m n, and c as m square? Is it clear? Yes. Right. So you see, that's the always the thing, right? When you find infinitely many solutions, then are these all the solutions? Obviously, for any m and n, you get a solution, and you get solutions. So you get many, many solutions, infinitely. But are there any other solutions? And we will show that there are none. And that also we sort of observed in the beginning of the class. The first few solutions that we found, and those were really the first few solutions because we kind of were doing a search, right? We showed that there are. We showed that they are satisfied in this. They are of this form. We found m and n for them. We want to find m and n for any solution, a, b, c. Any a, b, c you start with, it is of this form. That will be fantastic, right? That's one question. Second question is, well, which primes? We show that not all primes, like seven, cannot occur on the hypotenuse. So 
So, but okay, I'll share the details of that. It can be a little confusing. So, these are the things. So, there are some interesting things. And also, as I was saying, we can connect this to rational points on a circle. I will try to say how. So, we'll do that next time. And uh, then maybe I'll go into another method of solving, which is uh, kind of a little connected with induction and also this. So, infinite descent, and it has these things. Maybe we can look at. Uh, uh, is is this solvable? I mean, a to the four plus b to the four. We'll prove that this has no solutions. Maybe let's see. Maybe. This is the Fermat's last theorem, right? For n equal to four. I mean, this is easy. Obviously, the, the, the n case is is uh, like maybe hundred times more difficult. It's too difficult, and I don't know at all. I mean, I know little ideas. I don't know how to do that. Yeah, uh, yeah. But this we can try. And then maybe a cube plus b cube has no solutions. I think that is difficult. One can think about what can be done. And we should also realize the limitations of what we are doing. And then we will realize the limitations. And then we'll stop there. And then in the, later you can go do more. Okay. So that's it. It's just an infinite uh, ideas that come from these. Things. And let's see if you have more interesting questions then you should ask. So we'll stop here. Yeah, we should just stop here. All right. Uh, what is the time? Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. And this, by the way.